to start talking about the bones of the upper limb, we're going to look at this proximal area first, containing our clavicle or collarbone, scapula or shoulder blade, and then our humerus. Let's get started by scooching these out of the way, getting a little bit of a closer look at the clavicle. And the clavicle has this kind of distinctive S-shaped curve. It has a sternal end, where it's articulating with the sternum, part of the thorax. Then we have a curve here, and it has, on the other side, an acromial end that's going to articulate with the acromion, part of the scapula. The body of the clavicle is right here. It's the majority of it. The body or shaft is right there. And one thing you'll notice as we put these close together is that they really don't look like they should match up. The acromion here and the clavicle do not look like they make much of a smooth articular surface. The reason for that, and this is true on the sternal end as well, is that there's fibrocartilage on either side that helps it actually make a joint that sticks together with those other bones. Moving on to the scapula, we're going to flip it onto its anterior surface. So this surface here points posteriorly, that's going to be on our back, and here's the anterior surface of the scapula. You can start off by describing it has a medial border just here, a lateral border, and no big surprise, a superior border that's relatively uneven, has a lot of different features to it. Where the medial and lateral borders meet, we have the inferior angle, and where the superior and medial borders meet, we have the superior angle. As we follow the superior angle, we have a scapular notch, and this has a variety of appearances. It can sometimes form a little hole covered by a strut of bone, other times it's very broad as this one, other times it's a very narrow little notch, but that is the suprascapular notch. Next up, lateral to it, we have this thumb-shaped process called the coracoid process. And anytime we have a large bony process, that usually means we have muscles that are attaching there, or ligaments, and in this case we have both. So there's the coronoid process. We have the barely visible neck of the scapula here that attaches its head right here to the rest of the body. And the head is dominated by the glenoid process, uh, sorry, the glenoid cavity, this place where we actually have the articulation of the humerus occur. So that glenoid is where the head of the humerus and the scapula meet just there. There is a small supraglenoid and kind of extended infraglenoid tubercle serving as a site for muscle attachment. And this entire broad surface here that's going to be in contact with the rib cage is called the uh, subscapular fossa. Now if we flip onto the posterior side, one thing that's hard to miss is this strut of bone on the posterior side of the scapula. This is called the scapular spine, and you'll note that at some point here it detaches from the rest of the, of the bone and forms this swoosh up here more laterally. That is called the acromion, and again that's where we articulate with the clavicle. The presence of the spine makes a supraspinous fossa and an infraspinous fossa, and that's where we're going to have a variety of muscles attaching that go out to the humerus. Now, moving on to the humerus, we'll zoom out just a little bit here. The most notable thing we can see early on is the humeral head, this large rounded area just here. That's where it articulates with the glenoid fossa of the scapula. And just past it, we have two large bumps of bone, one more lateral, one fairly medial. If I tilt that, you can actually see those a little bit better. But these are the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle. There's a depression between the two called the intertubercular sulcus. Now one thing you can note is that the head of the humerus here and the tubercles have a little depression separating them. This is called the anatomical neck of the humerus and actually shows where different centers of ossification fused. But just below the tubercles, the greater and lesser, we have an area called the surgical neck of the humerus. So named because this is a common site for surgeries and it's located just outside the joint capsule, so it's a little more readily accessible during surgeries in this area. Alright, as we continue down the shaft or body of the humerus, there's not a whole lot for us to see other than that bone. On the lateral side there is a slightly roughened area which occasionally can be, make a pronounced bump. But this is called the deltoid tuberosity, it's where the deltoid muscle attaches laterally on the shaft of the humerus. Continuing further down, we get to this area. This is called the humeral condyle. 
Now the humeral condyle is where we're going to focus now, and I'm going to zoom in just a bit. This is going to be where we articulate with the radius and the ulna. The ulna articulates more medially, and it fits into this little area here called the trochlea. So the trochlea, just here, is the part of the medial humeral condyle where we have that articulation with the ulna. More laterally, we have a rounded area called the capitulum that articulates with the head of the radius. We'll see a little bit more of that in just a moment. But once again, medially we have the trochlea, a little more lateral, we have the capitulum, and all together, they're the articular surface, the humeral condyle, just there. Just above, or a little bit proximal to those, we have a medial epicondyle and a lateral epicondyle, where muscle attachments are going to occur. And this continues up onto the shaft of the humerus as a medial and lateral supracondylar ridge. So just another place where we can have muscle and connective tissue attachments. In front, we can see that there's actually sometimes a little depression here. It doesn't always form a complete hole, as we have, but that does happen. This is called the coronoid fossa. Next to it is the radial fossa, and both the head of the radius and part of the proximal ulna are going to be fitting into these areas when our shoulder's in complete, pardon me, not our shoulder, our elbow is in complete flexion. If we flip to the opposite side, the main thing to note here is this very large depression on the posterior side called the electronon fossa, where a very large part of the ulna is going to rest when we go into full extension. So let's look at that now. Here's our ulna. Very unique bone. The electronon process here is this very large area where the triceps muscles attach, and we have this section right here, the trochlear notch, that as we saw earlier, articulates with the trochlea of the humerus. The coronoid process is this anterior portion just here that's sticking up, so we've got the coronoid and electronon processes of the ulna right there. And then the ulnar tuberosity is this roughened area anteriorly where some flexors of the upper limb are going to attach to the ulna. We have a radial notch, this smooth area, that allows it to articulate with its radius. So we'll just set those two together briefly. And you can see how the radial head fits into that radial notch of the ulna. The rest of the ulna, again, forms a bone of a shaft of the bone and body right there and terminates distally with a little bump that's sometimes much more pronounced but this one's a little bit lighter but this is called the ulnar styloid process. Now we take a look at the radius now that corresponds to it and it's again another unique shaped bone. We have a very pronounced mushroom shaped head leading to the neck and anteriorly we have a roughened area here that is going to be the radial tuberosity. So the head, neck, and radial tuberosity are all very proximal. Then once again we have the shaft stretching all the way down to the distal end of the radius. Just as the ulna had a radial notch, the radius has an ulnar notch, only it is located distally. So now we can see how the ulna meets the ulnar notch of the radius distally right there. And now if we just kind of look at its undersurface, we see where it articulates with the wrist. That is going to be the carpal articular surface for the carpal bones of the wrist. Now if we look at the radius here, one thing you might notice is there's a very sharp border on its medial side and the ulna has a corresponding sharp border on its lateral side. In life, there's actually a ligament between these two called the interosseous ligament and that's their interosseous border that connects the two of those. Now moving on to the carpal bones, we have the carpal bones here articulated with the bones of the hand, so we'll run through those relatively quickly. We have the large digits here, so this is going to be the thumb, so first digit, second, third, fourth, fifth, and figuring out which one's which helps us a lot, medial versus lateral, with identifying these carpal bones. So I'm going to flip to the palmar side here. So we're looking at the palmar side of the hand. From lateral to medial, the proximal row is going to be the scaphoid bone. Then we have our lunate bone. 
Then we have our triquetrum bone, triquetrum right there. And sticking up off the triquetrum is this small P-shaped bone. That's going to be the pisiform bone. So proximal scaphoid, lunate. Then we're going to have our triquetrum and pisiform. The distal row forms these four bones right here. And that's going to be our trapezium, our trapezoid, our capitate, and our hamate. And all of these bones have specific unique features, but one that really stands out is the hamate has this ex really kind of prominent, if I can get a good view of it here, hook. That is referred to as the hook of the hamate, and it's going to be a place where a lot of ligamentous attachment is going to create the carpal tunnel here. So once again, hook of the hamate, very prominent on this palmar side right there. Then we move on to the bones of the hand itself. So once again, We've got a right hand here, so I'll just kind of put my right hand there and overlay. We'll zoom out just a touch to make that a little easier to see. And so here, all these bones are more or less organized the same way. These are the metacarpals, these long bones that actually form the substance of the hand. Then we have our digits, our phalanges, and each digit is made up of three phalanges, except for the thumb, or first digit, that's going to have two. So in terms of the anatomy of these bones, each metacarpal has a base, a shaft or body, and then a head. And it's going to meet the next row of these phalanges. And they're going to have also a base, a shaft or a body, and then a head. Now in the case of the thumb, we have a proximal and distal phalanx, and that's it. And in all the other digits, two, three, four, and five, we have a proximal, a middle or intermediate, and distal phalanx just there. So we've got those present there. One thing to note is that the distal phalanx on each one, we'll zoom in here on the thumb, has this kind of scalloped out or shovel shaped area here known as the tuberosity of the distal phalanges. Alright, I hope that has been relatively helpful in getting down the basics of the skeletal anatomy of the upper limb.